grace I hold too close How great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness Like a fetter Bind my wandering heart To the prone to wander Prone to up together as the church come thou fount of every blessing tune my streams of coffers every voice teach me some teach me some Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Our God is good, amen. Here at Anthem, we're all about building community. And so go ahead and turn to someone next to you, give them an airway, say, happy day seven. You know what's so awesome? Uh, this next song that we're gonna do here at Anthem um, is actually an original that Anthem Worship wrote. And uh, we're gonna be having an album release on July 31st, which is very exciting. And the reason why I say that right in the middle of a worship service is to say that God is moving here in this space. Uh, God is moving uh, amongst the worship team, the writers, uh, something's happening. Our God is strong in the midst of the storm. Our God is.
Hey, it is so awesome to hear the voices of the church singing together in our auditorium. And we hope that our online viewers, you at home, have also got to experience the presence of God um, as you've been singing with us. Uh, so glad that you could join with us today online for episode 14. Uh, before we head into our message, we have a lot of exciting things that are happening here, right here at Anthem. A couple of them that I just want to take a moment to share with you is, first of all, on June 19, this is a big one, we are going to be having our grand opening of Anthem. Anthem is going to be launching for the first time full on here in person, June 19. Um, starting at 9.45, we're going to be joining together to have coffee at our new cafe, and then our service will be starting at 10.30 sharp. So if you're in the SoCal area, we would love to have you come out for that. Um, as well as on July 31st, we are going to be finally releasing our album on Spotify and every other streaming platform. We're going to be having that night uh, an album release concert that night at 6 p.m. right here actually in our auditorium. Um, you can look shortly, we're gonna be having a registration out so you can keep an eye open for that, but we are super excited uh, to see what God is doing through the creative team here at Anthem. <laughs> Turning and turning, the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. And things break apart, the center cannot hold. For mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The Irish poet William Butler Yeats wrote this work called The Second Coming in 1919. So it's over a century ago, and I know that in a hundred years, a lot of things have changed. MySpace gave way to Facebook, which then birthed Instagram, which in turn spawned TikTok, and my friends, I used to call bros, and then I had to start calling them dudes, and now somebody younger told me that the preferred term is fam. And let's not forget, let's not forget, as everything changes, that parachute pants, yes, that ungodly, unholy invention from the 90s are back in vogue. So things change. But I'd like to posit to you this morning that what changes is really ephemeral. The things that matter, the things that last, those remain the same. I mean, th t take Yates as a case in point. I'm picturing him sitting at his desk, putting pen to paper, and writing those words. Picture him as he looks to the bed where his wife Georgie lies. The line that stays with me from the poem is the second to the last. Things break apart and the center cannot hold. Yeats is writing in a time where the world and his wife has just escaped from a pandemic that is ravaged. He's writing in a time where there are root wars and rumors of wars, the promise of bellicose and armed conflict. He's writing in a time where there is quite a bit of racial tension and division. He writes in the midst of a polarized society where virulent language has taken over our discourse. Things break apart, the center cannot hold. It is that line that could be used, I mean, we could try and use it at least, as a snapshot for our world today. I mean, think about it. We live in this time and in this place where language is utilized as a tool, a tool to define those who belong to me with the other, the unwanted, the different. It's a time where politics is paramount to faith. We inhabit this space, this space in an inconsistent society where we advocate, and rightly so I might add, for the unborn, while at the same time, we leave women fending for themselves. And we're kids, real children made out of flesh and bone, continue to languish in cages. The center cannot hold, 
and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. You know, what's funny about this time is that the world looks, looks at the church and says, what do we do? Things are breaking apart and too often the body of Christ simply shrugs its shoulders and says, well, you know, we're, we can't be bothered with that. You know, we're too busy thinking about the mansions that we have in a lawn, land far beyond yonder. Actually, we are waiting for mere anarchy to be loosed upon the world because then Jesus will come and we've become irrelevant. So perhaps, perhaps our Jesus, whom we love so much, should go out and hire an ad agency. Maybe some thoughtful rebranding can glow up his image. Maybe the gospel has lost its power to call and compel us, or even worse, maybe scripture is obsolete. Well, not yet. Don't give up hope just yet. Because I want with you this morning to open the ancient book in order to extract a message that is both timely and timeless. If you have a Bible, won't you open it with me to the gospel according to John, and we're going to be living, breathing, and dwelling in the eighth chapter. John chapter eight. Now before we unpack our passage for today, it is probably helpful for me to give you just the briefest of context. In some of your Bible, you will see that the passage is italicized. The beginning of the chapter has italics on it, and there'll be in some of your Bibles a note, a note that states that this passage doesn't appear in the earliest Greek manuscripts. It's uh, held by most scholars that this is a later edit or a later addition to the gospel. But in order to understand why someone inspired by God decided to place the story that you and I are to read today, a story that has continued feeding the body of Christ, we need to understand where Jesus is standing. So our story today has as its setting the temple in Jerusalem. And the time the time is the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was this wonderful holy day and holiday when the people of Israel would go and build tents. And in this tent, these tents they would dwell and the purpose of them living and dwelling in the tents was to remember God's gifting them the law while they were in the desert. This whole event was punctuated by Israel gleefully accepting the gift of Torah, the one thing that separated them from everyone else. Now the Greeks had their philosophy, the Romans had their buildings, but the Jews, the Jews had their story, their law, their Yahweh. And so they're standing there thinking about these things, muttering about the implications of the Mosaic law when a rabbi from this place that nobody has heard about called Nazareth jumps onto the scene. And he's speaking and teaching in a place in the temple that was reserved for women. You see, the most progressive of the Jews believed that it was important to give women a place to worship. And so they designated a space. And as Jesus is teaching these things, there becomes and starts stirring in the air a certain sense of discord. You can almost cut the tension with a knife as you hear the wails and the screams coming from the back of the temple. It's a cadre of men who are dragging a woman and throw her at the feet of the master. 
Individual compassion is now replaced by this corporate and communal bloodlust as they began to encircle them. They are oppressing and abusing a woman, a woman in the court for women. Which ought to clue us into the first reality that we as a church body needs to learn. The spaces that we build and the language that we utilize doesn't mean anything if those spaces and that language isn't imbued by the presence of a Jesus who who is impacting our practice. We can talk about inclusion, equality. We can say that we stand on the side of the marginalized and the victimized, but until that language translates into practice, It's empty words. So the woman, the woman falls on her face. I'd like to read to you how John describes the moment. John chapter eight, verse three says that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group. Can you picture this? Half-dressed, shamed, objectified. She's thrown there, nameless, a prop. A prop in a ghastly play masquerading as righteous indignation. And how often do we people of faith use other people as props to justify our righteous indignation? We point to others and we use them as examples of what not to do. We depersonalize and dehumanize. And then we wonder why things are breaking apart and why the center cannot hold. Now this woman is a marginalized woman. And the second thing that I'd like you to remember is that this book belongs to the marginalized. You know, too often congregations, families, people of faith have decided with the best of intentions to import Jesus to the margins. And then we're shocked when it doesn't work. And it doesn't work Because you can't import Jesus from the center to the margins. Jesus was born on the margins. I mean, Jesus is the son of an unwed teenage woman. There's a lot of conversation behind his back as to who his father is. Jesus comes from the ethnically and culturally diverse region of Galilee. And in order to make this timeless book timely, let me share one more thing with you. Jesus leaves his country, fleeing the violence that is in Galilee and resides as an illegal alien, a refugee in Egypt. This is a story for the marginalized because it's a story of a God who was birthed on the margins. So we ought to do well to stop attempting to import Jesus from the center to the margins. And you might be asking, well, what does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. William Easterly, who's a economist, looked at the history of religion and colonization. And he discovered that in this place called Sierra Leone, at the turn of the 20th century, people were attempting to import Jesus from the center to the margins. And much like Save the Children of Today, 
The British had constructed this system by which you could ensure that a quote-unquote savage, an other, a marginalized person would receive all the blessings that came with Christendom for five pounds. And so you would contribute your five pounds and they would baptize this savage with your Christian name. Importing Jesus from the center to the margins doesn't work because Jesus lives on the margins. In the law, they say, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And so here you have this collision, right, of two systems, two ideologies, two ways of looking at life. On the one hand, you have these patriarchal religious leaders They're interested in understanding the law. After all, it is the Feast of the Tabernacles. It's all about the law. And so they're attempting to place Jesus in that uncomfortable space. I know you've lived in it at some point. You know that space? That space that makes you squirm? The one that exists when politics and religion collide? That's where they're trying to place him. He says, they say, the law of Moses commands us to stone such women. They forget, though, that the law of Moses also says that both parties ought to be brought before the elders, that both parties are to be punished. They also forget to to understand that John has given us a hypothesis and a thesis that governs Jesus' ministry in Judea. He does it all the way at the beginning of his gospel in John chapter one. And you know the text, it simply says, for God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save the world. And so there she is surrounded, alone, objectified, and vilified, waiting for Jesus to engage the discussion. But he doesn't. He doesn't do that. By this point, a hush has fallen over the crowd People are waiting to see what he will say. And the Jesus that lives on the margins kneels down and begins to write on the sand. And a lot of ink has been spilled trying to determine what Jesus was writing. Some people say that what Jesus was writing was the first five commandments. Other scholars will tell you that what he was writing was the sins of the people that were surrounding the woman. But that's not important today. What's important is that Jesus decides to not engage in the conversation of oppression. Instead, Jesus decides to redraw the center. You see, up until that point, the ideology worked like this. We who live on the center necessitate the margins. We necessitate those lines that differentiate us from each other because the margins are there to serve the center. And Jesus is redrawing these lines and saying, in the kingdom that I have come to establish... In this gospel-driven message that I have come to preach, the center exists to serve the margins. And that's why you cannot import Jesus from the margins. You have to go and live out in the margins, dear church. So he starts writing. 
They're asking him this question about the law and Jesus starts writing and it's that same finger that millennia ago wrote the Ten Commandments. It's that same finger that carved those words onto the stone and in the back of my mind, a surge of righteous indignation begins to boil up. How dare they ask him about the law? He is the law. He is the temple. Too often we make our religion about a bunch of other things, don't we? And we make it about the day that you're supposed to come to church. And we make it about how you're supposed to come to church. We make it about what you need to believe in order to be accepted into our community. Christ cannot encompass all of our faith confessions, but we probably ought to begin with him because he's going to illuminate everything else. So they begin, he begins to write. He begins to redraw the margins. And what he is doing shouldn't be shocking to you and to me. Sven Lindquist, a sociologist, wrote a wonderful little book called Exterminate the Brutes. And Lindquist begins his scathing critique of those of us who would exploit the margins with these words. Lindquist says... You know all there is to know, and so do I. It is not knowledge we lack. What is missing is the courage to understand what we already know and to draw our own conclusions. You see, there's something inside you today that is moving and God is doing something. You know, God is telling you, if you feel empathy, empathy for victims of exploitation, empathy for people that have to live in a misogynistic society, empathy for those of us who continue to believe that what matters is the color of of your skin and not the content of your character, you should do something, but that takes courage. And courage begins with redrawing lines. Jesus keeps writing. And the religious leaders, as they do, simply keep questioning. Jesus I'm missing a beat, glances up, looks at them and says, let let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stoops to the ground. And he keeps writing. And again, we spend a lot of time wondering what is he writing? Well, I think he's redrawing borders. You know, at this point, what he's doing is that same finger, you know, that same finger that etched the contours of Adam's face is now redrawing the borders that separate us. You know, the borders that separate us as saints or sinners, as white collar, blue collar, or no collar, as educated or uneducated. All of those borders, all of those lines, Republican or Democrat, pro-choice or pro-life, all of those are being redrawn. And so what we are called to do if we follow the God who redraws lines is all these other things that we think we care about we ought to lay him at his feet. And I know, I know that that sounds like a utopia. But I think it's time 
for us to start living in a more utopian world. Because the world that we're living in right now is full of anarchy, the center cannot hold. So what does this, ut- what does this utopian world look like? I was walking with my baby a few years ago, and I don't know if you've ever had or seen a newborn baby. They're not that cute, but they're fascinating. And they're fascinating because they look at you, especially by their second month, they look at you and they, you get this glint of recognition and your heart just fills because you're saying to yourself, this child, this creature recognizes dad and they recognize mom and so I went and I talked to one of you who is in the medical field and I told him, my baby is looking at me and he recognizes it and physicians as they are, completely destroyed my illusion. Because what she proceeded to tell me was, well, you know that what is actually happening is there is a handover from the, cortic- from the subcortical to the cortical region, and so what is actually happening is that the, as this handover is happening, the baby doesn't know where to look, and so basically, you're witnessing a brain glitch. Blah. But then, then I read this wonderful little book. It's called A Thousand Days of Wonder. A Thousand Days of Wonder in a Utopian World. And it says that the biggest shock that a baby feels when he or she comes out of the womb, is light. You see, your lenses and my lenses yellow over time. And so we don't perceive the world as brilliant and as bright as it should be. But when a baby is born, the lenses in his eye or her eye are perfectly clear. And so I want you to picture for a second what that looks like. Imagine you are walking in a Greek village. One of these villages where every single house is white. There's a beautiful Mediterranean breeze blowing in the air. The sun is directly overhead. The blue waves lap against the shore. And you're wearing your sunglasses. And all of a sudden, you take your sunglasses off and you're blinded by this vibrancy and this light. What's funny is that we think that the dreary, dull, and divided world that we live in, we think that that's the real world. What if? What if we decided to follow the God that commands us to redraw borders? What if the world is meant to be brighter and and more brilliant than you could ever imagine? What if you follow a Jesus that looks at you in the same way that he looked at that woman all those years ago and says this, woman, where are they? Where are those who would objectify and dehumanize you? Those who surround you with bloodlust, and the desire to use you as a prop to prove a point. Where are those 
who continue thinking that what matters is your ethnicity, your 401k account, or how many letters you have after your name. Where are they? And you shuffle a bit, and you stand up, and you take those sunglasses off, and you can see the world as it ought to be. And you say, they're not here anymore. And again, you hear the words, has no one condemned you? You know, this woman was brought to Jesus by herself. The, her paramour, gone, abandoned her, left her. He actually used her too. And you know what Jesus did? And the God that wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger, the God that sketched Adam's face with his finger, you know what he did? He knelt down on the ground and said, I know that everyone has left you, but I am going to be the man that you need. I will never leave or abandon you. I will go anywhere for you. Which is why the earliest Christian confession that we made about this Jesus that redraws borders says that you were so important to him that he descended into hell for you so that you wouldn't be alone anymore. Can you be courageous enough today to take off your sunglasses? and look at the world as he intended it to be. Can you be courageous enough to say, I'm going to stop trying to import Jesus from the center to the margins? Can you commit yourself to service and say the purpose of the center isn't to be served, but to serve? Can you do all these things? And if your answer to those questions is yes, then here is the good news of the gospel. This woman came before Jesus, accused and deserving death, and Jesus says, you are not guilty. I will give you life. And life, life everlasting today and always. My Savior, Redeemer, my Father, my Healer, my God, my Rock, Lord, you are strong. Awesome service. We are so glad that you could join with us for another Anthem Online. Uh, before you go, we want to let you know that there is an opportunity to support Anthem. Everything that happens here, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And you can join with us, partner with us financially uh, to help keep it going every weekend. You can do that by two different ways. You can either text uh, LLUC to 77977. Um, or you can go online to lluc.org slash give and you'll be directed to be able to give to Anthem. So we are so glad that you can join with us. We're excited for June 19, July 31st. Lots happening here. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook at Anthem by LLUC and we will see you next time. Now we
your face.